Um, when I was 27, I decided to move to the Middle East and become a photojournalist. I hadn't started out with a career in photography in mind. In fact, I got my degree in applied engineering. But once I figured out that my passion wasn't programming, and in fact was photographing women around the world, I realized I probably wanted to be a photojournalist. Uh, I got some great advice from the head of of head of photography of the Associated Press, Santiago Lyon. He said, leave New York City, leave. And that was the best advice I ever got. I, there's too many photographers in New York City. And if you go places where there's news happening all the time, people take more notice of you and your photography. So I thought, why not the Middle East? Crazy news happens there all the time. And with that, I jumped off the deep end. I had a friend in Lebanon, and I convinced my parents that Beirut was becoming the Paris of the Middle East, and that it was entirely safe. Right. So on February 14th, 2005, I landed in Beirut, and not 12 hours later, I was standing on the American University of Beirut campus with my friend, and we heard this huge boom. It literally went through my body. I had no experience with things like this, but I had just been told that sometimes the Israelis like to buzz over Lebanon and break the sound barrier. So I turned to my friend and I said, was that a sonic boom? And he just stood there for a moment and he said, no, that's not what that sounded like. Okay, what did it sound like? And then he said, it sounded like a massive car bomb. Huh. Well, it was one of those moments where you realize, wow, I moved here to do this, and now I have to decide which way to run, towards the massive explosion or away from it. And so we ran towards it. Turns out that blast killed the ex-prime minister of Lebanon, Rafiq Hariri. It was a decisive moment in my life, if not the country's, and once we got there, I realized something very quickly. I was capable of staying calm in the midst of that chaos. My pictures weren't great, and I had no idea how to find editors, but I felt like I could work in that situation. I was completely green, and it was truly trial by fire. Now, having lived in the Middle East for over eight years and worked for places like the New York Times, the Associated Press, and Reuters, I feel like I have a little bit more of understanding about how to deal with those situations. First and foremost, don't freak out. Okay, figure that one out pretty quickly. But this might surprise people. That's not the hardest part. You have to be capable photographically of not getting overwhelmed by what you see in front of you. The best photojournalists are those that can get the hard-hitting images, but can also step back and find the quieter moments, and also those that add to a larger picture. I'd like to show you some pictures that I saw, took last year in Egypt uh, to show you the action, but also the larger picture. Nope, that's not me. <laughs> um, <laughs> In August, the Egyptian security forces violently dispersed a pro-Muslim Brotherhood sit-in uh, at Rabah al dawiya in Cairo. And then the day afterwards, at a makeshift morgue in the nearby mosque. That afternoon, the New York Times asked me to go downtown to a neighborhood to photograph street life, to show that even though there was chaos happening in some parts of the city, also daily life and people were continuing as normal. The contrast in these images are striking. And that's the point. Death and mourning versus quiet life. Because there's always more pictures than just the destruction. Take a look.
I've lived in Cairo on and off for a total of four years now, and it's definitely fascinating to be a woman photographer in the Middle East. I think something pe most people aren't aware of is there are a lot of women rock star journalists and photographers in the region. They are super strong, don't take crap from anyone, and do some of the best reporting I've ever seen. But I think when people hear about the harassment issues in places like Egypt, they just assume that female journalists don't go there. And that's just not true. Uh, I think being a woman actually opens up a lot of doors, especially in traditional societies. And I think that that's really, that's really important. Um, even if men are capable, a lot of male photographers do do women's issues, it takes a lot longer for those subjects to feel comfortable with them one-on-one. -on -one. A small example of this is protests. I have photographed a lot of protests, and I find that women demonstrators tend to stay in tight packs, and that male photographers, if they want to photograph them, hang on the edges because they don't want to invade their personal space. For me, the women are usually very inviting, and I end up smack in the middle of their groups. At the end of 2007, I became staff with the Associated Press, and in 2008, I photographed a lot of protests in, in the West Bank. I remember one time, a local photographer, a friend of mine, came up to me and half-jokingly said, he thought I might be a lesbian because when I got to protests, I always found the women and took lots of pictures of them. I hadn't considered my work in that way before. Um, I guess if most people take pictures of the men, then taking pictures of the women might seem a little odd. I thought about it for a moment longer, and I said, well, by that logic, most male photographers might be gay because they only take pictures of the men. He left me a little dumbfounded. And don't get me wrong, being a photographer, period, is hard in the region, and being a woman you have to deal with more issues like verbal and physical harassment. But we also get to cover more sensitive topics because women will open up to us more quickly. And that is well worth it. I'd like to show you a project that I'm doing in southern Turkey about women, a women's theater, all women's theater group. And they create plays about problems in their own lives from domestic abuse to lack of education for women. They go to these tiny little villages where sometimes villagers have never seen a play before. And they put on these plays, and you should see the reactions on their fa these people's faces. The emotion is amazing because they're seeing their lives on the stage. The name of their group is the Arulanskoy Theater Group, and it was very hard to get access. But I also know it would have been almost impossible if I had been a man. Take a look. There's been a lot of good things that have happened since I've moved to the region, and also a lot of bad things. And it's definitely not an easy time to be a photographer. You have to be a jack of all trades, from photo, radio, video, and editing. <laughs> and the media industry is hemorrhaging jobs. Unfortunately, some of the first people to go are usually the photographers. 
because people assume, wrongly, that anyone with a camera can take a good photo. Thank you, Instagram. Uh, it's frustrating, to say the least, but staying ahead of the game, that's what you have to do, and I enjoy learning new skills. I've, started, I've gone back to being freelance, and I've started a multimedia and software develop, de development company with two of my friends, so we can do just that and stay ahead of the curve. It is definitely hard to be a journalist, but when you find stories that you care about as history unfolds around you, that's amazing. If I could leave you with one thought, it would be this. When I left New York City and jumped into unknown territory, I felt like a crazy person. And sometimes I still do. And I'm also sure that some of my friends still think I'm insane. <laughs> but I found, I followed my intuition and I, followed my pa I found my passion. And that is worth a thousand blind leaps of faith. Thank you.